I was letting in a couple people. <clears throat> All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining the, joining us online for the Secondary Math Materials Community Review. This is our second opportunity for community review. We did have last week an in-person um, opportunity at BESE, and we appreciated everyone who showed up there. And then tonight we have this virtual one that we are recording. We will be posting the recording on the um, adoption website along with the feedback forms so that people can continue to review and give feedback through the end of the month. Um, I am Kristen Moon. I am the middle grades program administrator of math, science, K-8 STEAM, and K-12 Makerspace. And then also this evening we have with us uh, Susan Holbeck, who is the program administrator for high school math and science. And then we also have Mary Wiener. And Mary, I totally don't even know your title anymore. Uh, adoption manager. So I manage the adoptions for the district. Adoption manager. I heard extraordinaire in there. Um, yes. So we That's are on here. my business card. <laughs> We are here. Uh, Susan has put the link to the slideshow that so that you can view those things. There are some materials in there that have been shared uh, as part of the hyper some hyperlinks that you may want to look at, including the feedback form at the end. We do have a robust agenda for each of the vendors to present tonight, and then at the end we do have a question and answer time. Um, so let's get started. Is, is that a fire drill happening right now? Is that at your house, Kristen? It completely is at my house. Just one second. <laughs> That's happened to me on one Zoom call, not to my for the first time. It was an actual fire drill. Oh no. Yeah. I'm betting it has to do with somebody cooking dinner and something <laughs> maybe smoking. Kristen's partner. <laughs> <laughs> That's your dinner, Kristen. <laughs> All right, I can come back and we're gonna record this for you know everybody to know that delightfulness was brought to us by my husband and my son cooking dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the things we wanted to share is some of the work that has been going on in PPS around mathematics work and redesign as we've been reworking our mathematics vision. So a couple things uh, that I just want to highlight are the bullets here about preparing our students they must develop the skills to use number sense fluently, problem solve, attend to precision, think creatively and flexibly, build support and critique and argument, communicate mathematical thinking orally, visually, and in writing, make connections between mathematical ideas, patterns, and concepts in a variety of contexts. So one of the things we are asking all of you as you listen to the presentations and review materials is to keep an idea of what of these materials best reflect that in your opinion as you do um, engage in the um, review and hopefully doing the feedback form as well. Um, a couple of pieces on where we are in the timeline is that um, we did start this work all the way back in winter 2021. I was in a meeting today that just reminded me that I've been doing this for over a year now. And uh, we had our air committee, which is where teachers and building administrators, central office staff, they get to review materials and they select the two instructional resources to field test for middle school and two for high school. And then during the spring and summer of 2021, we do a lot. We did a lot of field test teacher recruitment um, to be able to teach the materials. We do go in and actively look at how these materials are being used, um, what's happening for students, all kinds of pieces there. And then the fall, we started our field test. Our field test does go through um, the fall and we do data collection all the way through spring break. Our teachers who are our field test teachers will be able to use the field test materials all the way to the end of the year because we don't want to cause any disruptions to learning inadvertently by not providing access to these materials all year long. Right now, you can see that we are in the community review piece. Um, and so that is this evening. A couple of things about uh, the um, agenda for tonight is that as obviously we're in introductions right now. If anything comes up that you would like to ask questions, please feel free to put in the chat. We are monitoring it. We will do our best to 
um, answer questions in the chat at the time, but we also will be creating an FAQ that we will post on the adoption website for anything that may take us a little longer to find answers. The vendors will be presenting for 20 minutes at a time. They will be sharing their screens and doing their own presentations. Um, so we're gonna start with mid-school math and then go to Carnegie and then to McGraw-Hill. And then we'll have a um, short little closing opportunity. And then um, we have breakout rooms for each of the vendors where you may go and ask any questions that you would like of those um, vendors until 7.45. And so I before just, wanna, we... just wanna add one thing that we're very strict on the time. So if you do have questions and we have reached the time limit for the vendor, the 20 minutes, you'll have to hold your questions unless you put them in the chat until that table talk and Q&A period at the end of the night. Thank you, Susan. So I'm going to stop sharing and then the person, I believe Scott from Mid School Math is gonna start sharing their screen. Sure. And Jacqueline is going to start us off with our thoughts. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and thank you for having us. We are honored to be here. Can everyone hear me okay? We can. <laughs> I'm whispering so I don't wake up kids on the East Coast. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, so I just want to start us off with a, a little meta moment. Um, I want you to think about your 12 year old self in your math class. I want you to think about how it felt when your teacher called on you for the right answer. I want you to think about how you felt when you were asked to put your answer on the board. Think about how you felt when you had a pop quiz placed on your desk in front of you. And think about when you decided that you were or were not good at mathematics. And I wanna just invite you from that memory <laughs> to come with us now and walk with your kids, your students, your family members into what we call and are proud to showcase as the mid-school math classroom. Jacqueline start us off by introducing us into those familiar feelings that we might have had from a long time ago. Um, and uh, I'll just, I'll preface this by saying that I actually just got a chance to watch an 80s movie with my, with my son. And there really were students who were walking up to the boards and presenting their different problems. Um, but I thought about the different approach that they had at that time, which was primarily sort of a didactic informational approach to teaching of information about how we teach math um, to today, to the things that we want to see in our classrooms. We like to call mid school math a multi dimensional growth mindset curriculum. Well, what do we mean by a growth mindset curriculum? And the very first thing is that when we contrast it with what we call a fixed mindset, a fixed mindset is where we do believe that we are just good or, or not so good at math. And our students, our kids, as they walk into those classrooms each day, have a very strong preconceived notion. Yeah, I'm good at math or I'm not good at math. And the very first thing that we want to do with our curriculum is to be able to try to break through that idea. We want students to have a growth mindset. I can get better at this. I can learn this material. It's going to be challenging. I'm going to make mistakes, but I'm going to get there. Well, how do we do that? Our most powerful antidote is that we've got to have student collaboration where students are having conversations and talking with one another. They're talking about the mathematics that they've learned. They're having discourse about the ideas. Um, and, and to get them to do that, we've got to have more than just sort of a piece of clip art that we throw in. Uh, we've got to have a rich narrative story that we actually care about, something that really ignites our interest in that particular subject. We want to do that in the strongest possible way. We want to use the strongest possible visuals. We know from research over the last 20 years that visuals are what light up the mathematical part of the brain. So we want to give them the strongest possible visuals that we possibly can. And then finally, we've got to allow for those students to be able to fail safely, uh, to be able to make mistakes. And as they say, try, try again. Now to do all of that, 
Um, and to actually make it functional in a classroom, we also need to have a curriculum that is focused. It's gonna be rigorous, but it's also gonna be accessible to our teachers and students. Sorry about that. Ed reports is hailed as the authority when it comes to reviewing K-12 instructional materials. And we are honored to have earned a perfect score in all three of their newly revised gateways. Um, the first gateway is focus and coherence. In this curriculum, students are going to go deep to solidify those foundational new learnings that are essential to accessing higher mathematics. The second gateway is rigor and mathematical practices. In this curriculum, student discourse is centered around hearty math context and group worthy questions that encourage the authentic use of the standards for mathematical practice. The third gateway is usability. The digital platform is easy to navigate, it's engaging and it's aesthetically appealing tapping right into where our students are right now, in love with technology. With all of those things in mind, um, even with the technology that we have today, we still got to answer that quintessential question that every single student, our, our kids are going to come to class and they're still going to ask, when am I ever going to use this stuff? And we cannot give them the answer that, well, you might use it 30 years from now, um, if, if you become a math teacher, that answer is not going to hold water with them. And so we've got to give them the answer that you're going to use it right now. And that's why when you log into the teacher dashboard for mid school math, it's going to look a little bit like Netflix. That's because that's how we launch each and every one of our standards. We want to immerse them into a context where that math is coherent. It might be uh, the cholera outbreak of the 1800s or the surface of Mars where students might think about, well, what is the mathematics that I would have to use if I were to escape the surface of Mars? Or something like, like building a goat pen. Um, but whatever that context is, again, instead of using sort of the old, I wanna call it the older mechanisms of approaching teaching mathematics, we want to use live actors, we wanna use animation, we wanna use real film, we need to immerse them in a context where that math can be rich, coherent, and have a degree of purpose so we can build in collaboration. Now, because they've been immersed into the rich conceptual context, beginning with the small film, and now, we're looking at students who've had an opportunity to collaborate. The depths of their student thinking have been tapped. Students are now primed to move into computational practice, and that practice is going to result in mastery. To get them to mastery, we really want them to be able to have access to the most advanced tools that are available with technology. Um, in this particular context, students can plot points, they can create a graph, they can do whatever it, whatever type of input you can possibly imagine. And the computers can do some of the hard work, which is to check that work. But we need a really sophisticated tool set for this really sophisticated learner in today's context. And you might be asking the question, which is... <laughs> Where do teachers teach? <laughs> well, for each standard, that teacher instruction is intentionally withheld until after students have noticed, they've wondered, they've gotten to struggle productively together, and they're actually asking now for that math. Like never before, the students want the teacher support with multiple strategies and multiple pathways and multiple entry points to find a solution. In short teacher lectures matched with visual representations of how math actually works. The teacher instruction component is the bridge from concrete to abstract. A part of moving from that concrete, from that abstract is that we use a practice printable. Again, we're starting with that familiar story and then we're gonna to move to ever more complex problems. We're not gonna see 35 of the same problem 
built into a worksheet like we might used to remember from back in the day, at least when I, when I was taught math. Um, and then in addition to that, we also have some really nice digital tools that allow for us, if we're in a remote setting, um, we're working with them, uh, places where uh, students can work on them, draw with them, they can be checked by a teacher. But we've also got on-demand tutorials. We've got students teaching other students so that if we're at home and we need that support, we've got it right there. Again, it allows for collaboration even within these practice printable formats. We've also got something that we like to call a clicker quiz, which is sort of a, uh, well, how would you state it, Jacqueline? <laughs> the clicker quiz is definitely a classroom favorite. Um, it's digital. Everything is built directly into the system, including the clicker. Um, and teachers appreciate this for a couple of reasons. It's a formative assessment, and it's also another opportunity for peer discussion and collaboration. It continues to enrich the discourse. It continues to center the student ownership um, and accountability for their learning. This tool, in short, is one of like the key pieces of the curriculum that's going to highlight that student engagement. It's going to continue that authentic integration of those mathematical um, standards, the standards for mathematical practice through the discourse. And it's a really, really great formative assessment tools, which is gonna inform us on mini and micro lessons, either teacher-led or student-led. It's worthwhile just to see the, the student reaction here to see what it looks like. Go, you have 10 seconds to vote. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Oh I love yeah. seeing I love seeing those two students that are banging on the desk and you got the student in the back that's cheering. That's what we're looking for, right? Those are the types of things that we want to see in our classroom. We've got an additional tool, it's called Test Trainer Pro. It's one of our big powerhouses in terms of helping students with uh, skills that um, they might be, we always talk about students that are coming into the classroom, but they don't always have necessarily computational practice or they may not be on grade level. And so uh, Test Trainer Pro is something that's very simple for teachers to use. Uh, we go into class, we use it for seven to 10 minutes. Um, it's, a, it's an opening sort of bell ringer. It adapts to the student ability level between grades one through eight. So even if students are missing skills from really early on, they'll get practice at their own ability level. Um, and it also includes uh, the skills for students in the most rigorous items of Algebra 1. It allows for us in class to take our classroom time to stay focused on the grade level while at the same time we're still building those practice skills. <clears throat> um, we also have three games. Uh, we've got Coast Journey, Empires, and Fate and Fortune in seventh grade and sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. Um, these are not smaller sorts of games. These are some of the most rich curriculum that we've ever developed. Empires, which you see here, is a story of an, being building an empire in ancient Mesopotamia, and it's multiplayer, and it's one of the richest. Ten. Ten. Oh. oh! Oh, I get it now. That's really wow. Wow. That is cool. Great, I love that, that is cool. They're, they're having really that aha moment um, after grappling with these multi-step problems. Again, these are some of the richest, most conceptual pieces of work. We never uh, you know, solve an equation and ha then have a balloon pop because that breaks the synaptic connection to that piece of mathematics. The, the story and the mathematics are all coherent. Um, and then when we put all these things together, those visual connections, failing safely, uh, student collaboration, we're seeing really enormous results. These results are specific to uh, those first two components, the math simulator and the simulation trainer. But when we compare that type of teaching or learning or thinking, we're getting about three times the typical learning effect. And when we piece all of that together, that's really what we're after but you can also see the rich engagement from students, which is where it starts, which is when am I ever gonna use this stuff? Oh, I've got a reason for doing that. And the next slide is probably my favorite slide. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Jacqueline. And that is, you see these two students, but it's not them working together. It's the work that's behind them that is my favorite part of mid school math. Um, these are student reflections where they're putting together 
a mathematical drawing, a, a narrative reflection of the math that they've learned um, into a full color picture. And those ultimately become a reflection of the work that we are doing in class. Instead of seeing commercial posters, we see the student work up around a mid-school math classroom. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Jacqueline, leaving it with, this is beyond just cute. Uh, these are these imageries, the pieces of work that we've done, help us remember the mathematics we have even months after the fact. So I think we're probably all at this point thinking about the elephant in the room, to be quite honest. I don't know how elephant in the Zoom maybe, right? Like, um, the mid-school math classroom looks, sounds, and feels probably very differently than the classrooms that we all were just remembering and reflecting on, right? Um, the architecture is intentional. The, the patterns, the flow from being immersed completely in a context that may be foreign to some students and some might really be already into it and have been exposed to that, um, to being able to converse with our um, peers in the classroom and from decentering the teacher and moving to facilitative um, teaching in terms of um, the teacher moves and centering the student as the owner of that learning. Um, there are so many places that this might look and feel differently. And it should, it's 2022. This should not be your skill and drill. This should not be what we felt before. Um, our children, quite frankly, my five-year-old and four-year-old who are asleep downstairs are not going to be learning in the same ways that we were learning or even that our kids are learning right now. And so when we think about that, think about how it is designed to invite every type of learner and proficiency level into the math, from your English language learners to your math confident students, to your students who need extra support because they have foundational gaps. We start with a question and it's followed by another question and by a visual. And then we get to the mathematics and that pattern is the gem. That's the key, multiple entry points, equitable classrooms. It's not a cliche. That's what the tool should be centered to allow the teacher to do. And so those tools that you've just seen coupled with the intentional pedagogy and the continuous professional learning that is going to come with this curriculum, that's what's going to build those math-minded human beings that our society needs. There are a couple of questions in the chat. We wanna say thank you before we answer any questions. And um, I want to check in with Susan for the time. Um, and if we're allowed to use this remaining time for question answering, we'd love to do that. Yes, you have a four and a half minutes remaining. Awesome, okay. So Scott, there's a first question yep. um, from Hannah Kramer about how much of the curriculum is intended to be on the computer compared to handwritten work. Sure, and just as a quick clarification um, with, with Susan and with Kristen, uh, are, are we to answer questions now or, or are they supposed to be designed for? You can answer questions now within your remaining uh, 20 minute time frame. So you have four Great. minutes remaining. Sure, um, the question about the compacted classrooms I think is the one that, uh, yes, we have a pathway for compacted classrooms. It's built in, it's our recommendation. Um, PPS might take that recommendation and, and tweak it a little bit depending on their own particular needs, but we do have a specific recommendation that we've looked into. Mm -hmm. And we in terms some... of your first question, sorry about that. Go ahead, Scott. Okay. That, that's, that's okay. I missed the first question, Jacqueline. I'm just looking at That's it. okay. That's okay. Um, the first question was just referencing uh, the balance between how much is on the computer and digital compared to handwritten. Um, the nice part about that is it's customizable, Hannah. You know, so for everyone to like hear that, um, that's important. So a curriculum should be customizable because you're not teaching the curriculum. The curriculum is a tool you're using to teach students that are in front of you, right? And while that may feel like a given, often that's misplaced and often it becomes about the material. So it is about the kids. It's about your kids, it's about my kids. And when we start thinking about that, this is customizable where you say, you know what? I want us to start off with the math simulator on the board behind me. I want everyone keyed in. I want you to turn and talk to your partner. What did your partner say as you're listening? After that conversation, now go to your Chromebooks. You've already been assigned your simulation trainer. Get into the simulation trainer. You have 10 minutes. All right, now I want you to discuss what you did in the simulation trainer with your partner. So 
as you think about the ebbs and flows of a classroom, a dynamic classroom, this curriculum is at the center of students and teachers being able to interface at different points, keeping the attention, keeping the movement, keeping that pace in the classroom mobile. Some classrooms are 50 minutes, others are 90. So here's a great place for us to push and pull in and out of digital and handwritten. And about, and about uh, just to kind of clarify that, about 75 to close to 80% of the time can be off of the device if we need be, or if we're in a remote setting, every single lesson we have can also be delivered online just because of our tools. So when we say customizable, it's 75 to 80%. There are a couple of tools that do require devices. And it looks like we have a little bit of time. So if anyone just wants to unmute and ask something, please feel free. Jacqueline, there was another question and I think it was from Hannah about how does uh, your curriculum handle compacted math pathway that PPS uses? And is there a compacted pathway already developed? Yeah, I think Scott took that one first. Okay. Um, but Hannah, if you can unmute and just let us know if we answered that for you. Uh, yeah, this is Hannah. Um, sort of, I guess it sounded like you would work with PPS to figure out what compacted math pathway would work. Um, but I just wondered if you have like standard pathways for middle school that does uh, through um, algebra in middle school. We, we do. Um... We happen to call it accelerated pacing within our, uh, the way that we put it in pad is cemented guide for that or recommended pacing. Yeah. And kind of a related question, does each less lesson have extensions um, or like, how does that work to address the needs of a wide range of students? So for each one of the lessons we have a, um, we actually have a, uh, a recommendations for both accommodations and extensions as well. Um, so those extensions are built in or recommended specific to those lessons, um, but they are built in for each one. There's also an awful lot of additional extensions that we would recommend outside the scope of this conversation um, that aren't just within that particular lesson, but are at the broader grade level. Time is up and we'll stop talking. Thank you. Time is up and my timer is, um, I gotta turn it off. <laughs> okay, uh, Kristen, you can identify and introduce the next uh, presenters, please. Uh, yes, I believe we have the team from Carnegie Solutions who will be presenting about both their middle school and high school as we are piloting both their middle school um, materials and their high school materials. And I believe Presenting from there is Anita and Dan as well. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're excited to be able to share our Carnegie Learning Math Solution. And as Kristen just said, even more excited that we are working both with the middle school and the high school um, in our pilot process. So Dan and I are here tonight to share with you a little bit um, as what I liked about this is that we started out with the vision for Portland Public Schools so that parents are clearly able to identify what the, the differentiators are as they're looking through these curricula. Um, one of the things that we talk about, and this is you know showing my age just a little bit, is that when I was in school, these were the most valued skills in 1970, right? Writing, computational skills, reading skills, oral communication. And you can see as we go down the list, Almost 30 years later, when my children were in school, look where those, those top ones dropped all the way to the bottom, right? Writing, computational skills, reading skills. What was most important starting even in 1999 was teamwork, problem solving, building these interpersonal skills. And then as we move into the 2020s and 2022 as we are now, those are still maintained as some of the top skills that uh, the Fortune 500 companies seem deem as most valued from problem solving, teamwork, strong ethic, 
um, communication, analytical and qualitative skills, quantitative skills. So I think a lot of what we're gonna talk about with Carnegie Learning is built on how do we produce the next generation of great thinkers to be able to, to fill the needs that we have in our communities. Dan? Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, when I run into community members who have been exposed to Carnegie Learning, the first thing they say is, I want to have something that resembles the math that I did. And I want, uh, you know, maybe if I'm working from home, I want to have something that tells my kid how to work through the math and then gives them a chance to practice that. This graphic here shows why we have restructured the math classroom the way that we have. The world has changed dramatically since we were in school and we no longer want to make human calculators. We want to make problem solving mathematicians who are good at working with others and who can think dynamically and critically while applying mathematical principles on a deeper level. So let's talk a little bit about the Carnegie Learning Way. There are some guiding principles that we live by and work by each day. One, and I think one of the most important, Dan will expand, is that all students are capable learners, that the perspective matters, and that it's very important that every student be able to see themselves in the mathematics and also be able to access and do well with the mathematics and think at high levels. Dan, you've worked with this a lot more. Absolutely. So this is important to us. The twin towers of social justice and education are high access to good instruction and high expectations for your students. Carnegie Learning, we believe in your kids. We have rigorous materials because we, we have a strong faith in their resilience and their ability to do the deeper level of thinking that strong math requires. Students also learn by doing. Um, so we take the stance that as we start to work with students, that we have to engage them in the mathematics that they're interested in thinking about, in production problems, things that they can actually engage with and be able to produce the mathematics and think just like a mathematician would. I remember we worked with some, some early kindergarten and second grade students one day and I asked them what real mathematicians did and one of them said really hard worksheets which really shows that shift that we have to make because we don't want kids to think that math is about doing really hard worksheets we want them to see how they can use the math and how they can do the math themselves we also take a very strong stance around assessment you know I said um, quite often I'm from Georgia so this may sound a little southern but you can weigh a pig is every day and all you want to, it's not going to get him any fatter. You have to feed that pig to get him fatter. And so we really do believe that students learn through assessment and that we can assess through their learning. And so you'll see through the problems types that we put in front of them, the tasks that we put in front of students, and also through the dynamic software that we use, that students' knowledge will emerge over time and that just taking a test on any given day is not going to be an accurate reflection of what they know and they're able to do. So what we want to do is we want to assess students as they're learning and make that a part of the learning process. And that just goes with the last one, which is that education is a human endeavor and that we work continuously to show students how to collaborate, how to problem solve and how to work um, together in a collaborative classroom. And so just a little bit about that design. Dan, anything else I should add there? No, I just think that uh, aside from the collaboration, which most of us know really is the bedrock of uh, having success in life after high school. Um, we don't exist in silos. We don't go to cubicles anymore. We work with one another to solve problems. Um, additionally, having all of this math tied into real world examples, introducing students to the math by giving them problems to solve that they will encounter as young adults and as not so young adults will make the challenges that we place before them immediately relevant and exciting for them. So let's dig into the materials just a little bit and share with you what the Carnegie Learning Math Solution, both at middle school and high school is like. First, let's start with the materials. We have this perfect blend of learning for students. There's this part that is a consumable write-in math textbook. 
It has all of the resources that a student would need to do any of our lessons, whether it is cutting out and sorting, or if it is graphic organizers, or if it's a manipulative that they need, everything is contained within this book. This is the book for collaboration, for putting their thoughts and to keep a journal of all the math that they're learning throughout the year. The second part is learning individually. And this is where our software is our secret sauce, I would say. It's over 20 years of experience of working with how do students learn mathematics and really doing what we call knowledge tracing. I compare it sometimes to your GPS when you get in your car or you do your maps. And our software doesn't wait until a student makes a mistake or it doesn't wait to the end to grade them and tell them what they did right or what they did wrong. It tells them just in time. So as students are working through the software, they're getting just in time hits. They're being able to see their progress as they go through it. But you know, we can talk about the resources. I think it's really important, Dan, that we be able to show them what a math classroom looks like for Carnegie Learning. So I do have to stop my share and share again because I forgot to click this share sound. So now I've got that on there and I'm gonna escape. So um, trying to escape here. Here we go. Let me tell you the story of my math classroom. How many terms are there in eight? Here, math isn't just about numbers. Plus X it's about thinking. My classroom is a place where students have opportunities to collaborate with each other, to solve problems in many different ways, to challenge the ideas of their peers. Would it be X to the fourth power then for the third one? I don't give them knowledge. I help them own their learning. Like that. And they do. Two types of tiles. I got into teaching because I wanted to make a difference. And with Carnegie Learning, I really can. I can count on their support in person or on demand. I can meet my students exactly where they are. 3X? I can empower them to work together to solve real problems. Are there any squares here? And reach those aha moments. The Mathia software is kind of like my co-teacher. It coaches and pushes my students the way I would if I had that kind of one-on-one -on -one time with each of them. Each student gets their own adaptive pathway, which gives me tremendous insight. If we cover a topic together in the textbook, Matthew tells me exactly what each student knows, what they don't know, and even where they're headed. So I can always see the big picture and never lose sight of each individual. Here's the bottom line. My students are going to succeed. How do I know it? Can I give you a hint? Because they leave my classroom as thinkers knowing how to take on challenges, knowing how to communicate and share their ideas, knowing how to persevere when things get tough, and knowing how to make sense of the world that's in front of them. I build the next generation of great thinkers, and this is how I do it. So just a small glance into what a Carnegie Learning Classroom looks like from a teacher's perspective and seeing with the students. What I hope that you were able to see, and I'm backing it up here, is that you were able to see the collaboration where students are learning together in small groups, where the teacher is facilitating that learning as questions that are going to help the students to unravel their thinking and to make sense of their thinking. Um, you know, we don't want students to leave class that day and say, what did you learn today? And they say, we played with blocks. No, we want them to be able to talk about the mathematics in precise terms and be able to explain that both verbally, numerically, algebraically, and graphically. And so our Here's the learning individually where they would be working on the software. I heard the question earlier, how does this blend work? And we see students in different models all across the country that work with the software. Sometimes the software is done outside of the classroom. For the most part, we encourage it to be a part of classroom instruction. All of our lessons are designed for 150 days of instruction, and that includes software built into it. 
So we know that in that 180 day school year, there are assessment days, there's picture days, there's pep rally days. So we made sure that we were able to go deep with each of our lessons and make sure students were able to understand it. The way the lessons, each lesson is designed is to engage students in some type of a task that would um, interest them at their grade level. Um, that is where we look at not being uh, blank slates, but we really look at these students as being messy boards, right? They've got ideas, they've got thoughts, they've got gaps in learning and they've got some unfinished learning. And what we try to do in this is we try to engage them where they are, find the access points. We have all of that differentiation for EL students and for special ed students. All of that is listed in how to accommodate, how to expand the lessons, for our accelerated learners. So all of that is a part of the engage, the develop, and the demonstrate. So we've engaged the students in a task. We're then going to develop their understanding through different problem types like thumbs up, thumbs down, where we're analyzing problem types, where we're looking at who's right. Um, we've got other problem types that are uh, the graphic organizers, Dan, you might be able to give me a few more because my mind is on East Coast time right now. But at the very end, it's really important that students be able to demonstrate the mathematics that they've learned. So not only can they show that in the software, which is continuously assessing them as they're working through the software, but it also has the performance task. And we have all of the other types of assessments that traditionally teachers have used but also give them opportunities to do different types of assessments. And Dan, I know you're in the airport. Is there anything you can add there? That's right, just checking in from the beautiful PDX airport. I would <laughs> say there's an instructional design that assures learners that it is okay to take multiple strategies to a solution and that it is okay to make mistakes. And so we actually put uh, we put wrong answers into our book for students to see, uh, which does a couple things. One, it shows students, hey, uh, I was kind of thinking that way and maybe I need to rethink what I'm doing. It also reinforces for students that uh, part of being an emerging mathematician is making yourself available to make mistakes as you continue your growth. Yeah. And because the software is such an integral part of the data and the assessment piece, I'd like to spend just another moment taking you through and letting you hear from our, our Carnegie Learning experts that have been working on this software for over 20 years, exactly how that works. And I think I just closed that screen out, Dan. Hey, Ania, if you right click over to uh, on the top of the bar, it should allow you to open your last closed tab. If I right click where? The top of the screen uh, next to your uh, tab. Oh, I love it when people know stuff like this. Here we go. Yay, Dan, you saved me. Don't forget to share audio when you share again. It's easy to tell a student what they got wrong. It's harder to determine it? and tell them why they got it wrong. And our software does just that. Our goal at Carnegie Learning is that we produce kids that learn how to think. The features of the software provides them those opportunities to become that self-directed learner. We're not just picking problems with a prompt and a final answer box. We are really mimicking what a real teacher does teaching. As you look at the hints and the just-in-time feedback, they're getting 45 minutes of one-on-one -on -one guided instruction in a way that a human would talk about it. Kids can work at their own pace. As they work, the system is collecting data. You suddenly have insights that you've never dreamed of. There's a whole bunch of fine-grained steps that the student needs to take, and that all of those steps are important to the final answer. By tracking student interactions as they go step by step through the problem, we get the sort of information that a human tutor would have in a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the student and to constantly learn about how it is that they're learning. Not only will you know how many problems they're doing and how many workspaces they're working through, but you'll know data about whether your students are going to be successful at the end of the year. District administrators and superintendents become predictive throughout the entire school year and they're not surprised at the end when test scores come out. Rather than, for example, taking a test, teachers are going to have immediate feedback, real-time information about where everyone is. Well, that information should inform them what goes on in the classroom. 
and then they can make decisions about how to group kids together based on that data. The whole idea of to provide the teachers the support they need so that they have the time to spend with individual students that need their time. For students that might be afraid to raise their hand in class, you put them in front of this software, all that's gone. They can ask for help, nobody knows. It's just a student and a powerful piece of software. So Dan, just a couple of things that I would add before, and I know I saw our time, so we're getting short on time is one, this is what is called the stellometer, what you're seeing here. This helps us measure individual skills that students need to know to understand a concept. For example, in linear functions, there's this idea of slope. In slope, students can do, I, I can tell from the data whether they can do it when it's a whole positive number, but if it's a fraction and they're struggling, then I know that, or if it's a negative number. So then I know exactly where I can hone in and support those students and how I can group them for success. And so Matthew truly becomes the secret sauce for both parents, teachers, students, and administrators as they are looking through their stuff. So one other quick video, Dan, and then we will close it out for questions. Well, so go ahead. I, I just I just wanted to, and, and maybe we can, I don't know, I'm open to skipping the video, but I just wanted to say a few things about Mathia because I think it's important. One, um, there is an extensive data that's available through your students using Mathia. It is a data-driven program and a lot of formative assessment data is available. Standards progress, skills progress, and I would even frankly admit that perhaps during the Portland field test, this has been an underutilized portion of the Mathia experience which uh, hopefully we can look at as a growth opportunity for what remains. Um, also, it's mastery paced, which means that you, as soon as your students show that they have completed uh, full proficiency in what they're working in, they can move on. For those students who you're worried about them being challenged appropriately, they can move ahead or they can um, stay in the content that they need to reinforce before they move into what's next. <clears throat> also, we are always concerned about the newcomers to the English language or those who uh, maybe don't have strong reading proficiency. Our software has text-to-speech. It is available in Spanish as well as English and is Google Translate capable with uh, the ability to do over 25 accents. So your students are uh, met where they're at as they're growing as English language readers and speakers. And I wanted to quickly answer that question. Yes, it is uh, available to use with Chromebooks out of the box. That's probably the platform that Mathia works best in and most frequently in. Dan, one other thing that I found last week, parents were not realizing when, the, especially those that were piloting, is up here in this very top corner, you see glossary. So, for example, my student doesn't know what a 45-45 right triangle is. I can hit the glossary, type it in. It gives me not only the definition in English and Spanish, but it also gives me a worked example of what that looks like. So it's a really powerful piece when students are struggling and they just want to find out how to do that one thing. Anything else, Dan? Any other questions? No, we have two minutes. I'd be interested to open the floor up to our audience. Hear what you guys have to say, what you're concerned about, or if there are any questions. I would just like to say, I believe Dan and Nita are open to that going in the chat, or you may come off mute and just ask directly. We've done acceleration. I know that was a question that is a big part of what we do is to work with the acceleration of students to have algebra one by eighth grade. Um, so we do have defined pathways already created, and then we also work to customize those with districts according to their plan for acceleration. Everything is customizable. Our textbooks are customizable, and especially Mathia, to meet the needs of the teacher or the district. Uh, content sequences that match what the building or district is doing. So to close, Dan, I think it's important that we have a seamless, coherent curriculum, sixth grade all the way through Algebra II. We're excited to be piloting uh, both middle school and high school with Portland Public Schools. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you in our chat room soon so that we can answer any other questions you have.
you everybody for your time. Nice timing. All right. Thank you, Dan and Anita. We appreciate that. Um, I'm not sure. I believe, Anita, are you sharing? Okay, fantastic. So um, we are going to transition to um, Brian and Christy from McGraw-Hill Illustrative Math. These are materials that we are field testing um, in our high school classrooms. Most excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, everybody, for your time this evening. I want to send a special shout out to Susan, uh, Kristen, Mary. Thank you so much for, for um, creating this event for us and uh, considering us for the review. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Christy LaFleur. Um, Christy LaFleur comes to us this evening with over 18 years of experience as a mathematics high school teacher. Um, she is our illustrative mathematics certified trainer and has been side by side with the Portland Public Schools pilot team. Um, Christy's been a McGraw-Hill specialist for over 15 years now. And uh, without further ado in this condensed time, I'd like to turn it over to Christy. The floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Brian. Yes. And if you don't mind, man in the chat, if there's anything that pops up, just let me know. Well, welcome, everyone. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. Really appreciate it. And I am excited to share with you illustrative mathematics. Illustrative mathematics is the highest rated, rated curriculum out there. And it has basically been partnered with McGraw-Hill, a partner you can know and trust. Now, the other key within McGraw-Hill Illustrative Mathematics is that we also have an adaptive personalized learning system called Alex that um, puts each and every student on their individualized pathway. So what's the idea behind Illustrative Mathematics? Well, the whole vision of Illustrative Mathematics is a world where learners know, use, and enjoy mathematics. I mean, as a high school math teacher, I want my students running to the math class and being just excited as they are about math, as they are about running home at the end of the day or running to lunch or to their favorite um, course. So that's the key idea behind illustrative mathematics. Now, the beliefs of illustrative mathematics is that every student has that growth mindset and can learn mathematics. More importantly, each and every one of us bring a unique perspective that's very welcome and needed to the math classroom. That students can make sense and solve problems on their own. That students must play with the mathematical ideas before we formalize any names, conventions, or processes are introduced. I like to say that students really get the opportunity to tinker with the mathematics. And I think about it. I think about, you know, my kindergarten class, my um, first, second grade, what were some of the favorite things that those students did? They had center time, and that's exactly what you'll see. You'll let students really, as I said, play with the mathematics. And we want to develop that mathematical understanding and the language capacity interdependently. So we want all of our students, whether English is their first language or their second language, that we're continuing to learn the language of mathematics within illustrative mathematics. So one of the keys with illustrative mathematics is that this is a problem-based curriculum. And within that, we move away from what I like to say, the I do as a teacher, then we do as a class, and then you go and do a lot of practice problems. No, we move away from that, and we move into a much different setting. And I like to say it's more of a you do, y'all do, and then we do. What do I mean by that? We start with number one. But the teacher ensures that the, the students understand the question. And then, most importantly, we give students some individual think time. And we want to monitor and walk around and listen to see if there's any questions, but giving that student that quiet think time. Then from there, we move into where students are going to work as groups. And this is a teacher walking around, monitoring listening and asking questions to make sure that students are understanding. And most importantly, during this time, I like to say those that are doing the talking are doing the learning. And so that's exactly what our students are doing. And then lastly, step four is the teacher helps students synthesize that learning. So we're gonna put that big bow on it and allow students to do that. So the whole idea behind illustrative mathematics Anywhere within the curriculum is this overarching idea. We're going to start each and every course, unit, lesson, activity, 
with an invitation to the mathematics, a low floor, high ceiling activity so that all of us can participate within the mathematics. From there, we'll move into a deep study of the concepts and procedures. This will be in the form of a task and an activity, as I said, where the students have that think time, then they'll move into some group work. And then as a teacher, I'll come in and step three will be where we consolidate and apply the mathematics. Let me show you what I really mean by that. Let's take a look at this square. And within that square, what do you notice? I would give my students about a minute quiet think time here. And then perhaps some of my students would say, oh, I notice that there's three points in each square. I notice that there's points on corners. I notice that there were rectangles. And then from there, we would ask our students, what do you wonder? And once again, allowing students to see. Well, I wonder what the points labeled. What are the size of the rectangles mean? Why aren't the, they're in alphabetical order? You know, different things. Just allowing students, creating this classroom where they're thinking and creating each and every day so that students can really empower themselves and see the mathematics. Now, one of the hallmarks within illustrative mathematics is the routines. So what I just shared with you was a notice and wonder routine. And I think everybody can agree with me within the last two years, we've all learned the benefits of routines, the what, the how, the why. So each and every lesson will begin with a math content routine, such as that notice and wonder or which one doesn't belong. Embedded within the task, you'll also find language routines, language routines that were developed out of Stanford University interdependently with graduate students in English and in math, and really to help, as I said, students understand the language of mathematics. The key idea about this is that we don't have to stop and attempt to teach them or find a spot exactly where they uh, belong. They just occur the overarching idea. And the idea is, is that once these students begin to really embrace them, these routines, then it leads to much greater discourse within the classroom. So what you'll also see embedded is a much um, desired book by NCTM called The Five Practices for Orchestrating Productive Classroom Discourse. So that's another key within the activities. As a teacher, we'll ask teacher to go around and monitor. And then once they uh, monitor, sorry, they'll start by anticipating the strategies that the students will use, and then we'll monitor. And then once student, uh, teachers monitor, then they'll select, select different groups to talk about the task and sequence those so that we're moving along the concept. And then of course, last but not least, that synthesis, that connection. So the overarching idea with this in illustrative mathematics and one of the key hallmarks is that design principle that we wanna promote the mathematical language use and development in the curriculum and instruction. So as I mentioned early, every single lesson, every single unit, every activity will always have this level of invitation to the mathematics and then we'll have the deep study and then the synthesis. Let me show you what I mean as we work through a particular lesson. That notice and wonder, how does that appear? How does that apply to what my students have? Right here, I'm going online, and you'll see this is the online platform, and it works with any device. As a matter of fact, there's even an app for it. So we want to make sure that we have the equity and the access so a student can download the free app. And if they don't have internet access, they can still get to their content of their book, they can still interact with it. And then when they get back, they can, it'll sync back up. Um, the question was asked about print and digital. So here is an example of the full four color print book. So right here, that warm up that you see, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Giving students the full access. And of course, Google Translate, 
So over to 109 um, different languages and there is audio support within our book. Now I'm just gonna go in so we can take a quick look at that lesson structure right here. And for those of you that are teachers here on this, as well as parents, your students will have access to this. This is what I like to call my grab and go resource. It's basically the structure of this lesson walk through in the form of an interactive presentation. So here, the students have that invitation to the mathematics. You know, let's talk about perpendicular bicycles. As students move forward, we'll have that notice and wonder and students will be able to interact with that. Then we'll move into the activity. And this activity is called, Who is Closest? And within this, you'll see the company wants to break the city down into regions so that whenever someone orders from an address, their order is sent to the store closest to their home. They've hired you to decide how to partition the city between the three stores. Explain and show your reasoning. So students have worked with our dynamic software and they've gone in and they know how to create a perpendicular bisector. So now students can just go in and use this and take the software and go in and work with the material. So that's one of the keys that students will have access to right here. Of course, there'll be places to help students and extensions. So like, for example, here number four, now a fourth store opens. We need you to partition the city again using the sketch below. So giving students that chance to make it all the way through. And then of course, even, even more extensions. Are you ready for more? This is a dynamic piece that students can work through and each and every lesson will have this consistent structure of the warm up activities. We'll synthesize the activities. We'll move into the lesson synthesis and then we'll have a cool down and a summary. Now within the cool down, this will be what we usually call maybe their exit ticket. And right here within their exit ticket, we'll ask students, Write a letter to the owner of the company that has four stores in your city. Explain what the diagram you drew tells them. Ask them for any information needed to help them decide how to distribute the 100 employees among the four stores. So in continuing to keep the mathematics relevant within the lesson. So from here, we move into, as I said, the invitation, then from the invitation, to the, um, the deep connections and then consolidation. Of course, all along the way, teacher narratives will include differentiation strategies to help support those English language learners, support students with disabilities, um, equal access for all and anticipated misconceptions. Within illustrative mathematics, there are critical practices. And within those critical practices include the intentional planning, the intentional planning of working through and having that end in mind and working through the activities. Establishing a set of classroom norms that students are comfortable in, that they can agree and disagree uh, respectfully with each other, that it's okay to make mistakes, that we're going to work through and persevere in our problem solving. Of course, one of the hallmarks is that shared understanding of the small set of instructional routine using this highest rating curriculum and then the ongoing formative assessment. Now within illustrative mathematics, students will have access to key assessment pieces. It will continue to be what we call distributive practice. So they'll have a little bit of um, practice on today's lesson. And then there'll also be a key practice that as they, um, from previous units in previous lessons. Now, what I realize is I look here, I'm looking at my calendar and I've assigned my students my cool down because I could do that in print or digitally. And I've assigned my lesson materials. 
but it looks like I forgot to assign my practice. But let me just show you real quickly how easy I can go in. And let me just assign that practice for my students. So there, whenever I go back over to my dashboard, I have that assigned to the students as well. And then the students can go in and they'll be able to do this. They'll have it in their print book right here. And within the print, you'll notice that we didn't stop the four colors whenever it came to their practice. Anything that they need for the colorful will be their diagrams, key things will also be there. Of course, everything is perforated in three hole punch. So if they need to take that out, they can definitely do that too. Anything they do digital can be auto scored and then teachers can receive reports, standards reports, activity reports that truly allow um, the digital support. So with illustrative mathematics, it truly is a world where learners know, use, and enjoy mathematics. And with McGraw-Hill, you get the highest rated curriculum and a true partner that you can know and trust. And our professional development doesn't stop with just initial assessment. We are here for the lifetime supporting along with digital support and continued support. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to Brian to let him talk just a little bit more. And then we'll also look and see if there were any questions in the chat. Awesome. Thank you so very much, Chrissy Lafora. That is amazing. Um, I am curious to know, Susan, could you tell me what we got for, for a timing perspective? Five minutes and 22 seconds. Oh, I could okay. talk, I could oh, talk ouch, five okay. hours and 20 seconds about our professional development, but uh, I'll just do... Uh, a quick little overview, and it's 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 the most amazing piece I feel um, beyond our curriculum and content, and the McGraw Hill standard is the professional development. Um, um, case in point, the one thing I want you to take away um, from this call um, is just the fact that as unique as Portland Public School District is, so is going to be the implementation plan, right? So is going to be the professional development, the ongoing professional development that is going to be fully customizable. That is the biggest takeaway. Beyond, you know, from a, that's the macro level and for the micro level, we've done things um, in the past, especially with the COVID, um, uh, daily webinars, right? That you can sign in on a variety of different topics on a variety of different subjects um, where you could see, you know, a topic on, on delivering the best distance learning uh, lesson on, on algorithms, for example. Um, we do, we do um, on demand, there's an on demand, kind of like your, your cable on demand where you can view pre-recorded recordings and they're, they're broken down into 15, 20 minute snippets. So you can get a nice little refresher um, if you're a seasoned teacher or if you have a substitute teacher coming in um, or a sub, um, you're able to give that refresher on, on the online and print conditions on all of the different topics. Um, it's again, the biggest takeaway for me uh, for this night was <laughs> would to understand that it's a fully customizable implementation plan that we are able to provide and it's ongoing. Um, and Brian, I want to add that, you know, one of the other successful piece that we've had is office hours so that we do those office hours that kind of just like, you know, I think about whenever I was in school, if I needed to pop in and ask a quick question to a professor, I could do that. That's kind of the, the idea that we have here um, embedded within our support, too. Well, another layer of that, you've been in the office hours the whole time with our team piloting illustrative mathematics, and that's been fun to fun to sit aside and be a uh, fly on the wall per se. Um, I've learned a lot. So it's been, you know, it's just as, as, as macro and micro as you can get it. But again, just fully customizable. That's going to be unique to your district um, in that implementation plan and the ongoing support. Anyone need to unmute any questions? Well, of course, we'll be available in the breakout rooms as well. But any questions here? And while we wait on that, I'm going to go ahead and post, um, if it's okay, um, um, Susan, uh, Chris, and Mary, um, my contact information as well as Ms. LaFlores. Yeah, you're welcome to put that in the chat. And um, any other uh, vendor uh, representative is also able to add that to the chat. 
So we have a question. I've noticed with my students that they become at times more frustrated with interacting with the software than math itself. They also like a large number of practice problems in print that they can use to do practice math. How does this curriculum address these? So excellent question. And that is one of the key things um, whenever I do go into pilot classrooms, uh, I ask students, I'm like, what's your favorite thing about this? And a lot of times I think it's probably because of all this Zoom and remote learning, they absolutely are print. You know, they love the four color, the, the chance that they have to interact with that. I can tell you with this, um, with this new platform that McGraw-Hill has, um, I haven't seen a whole lot of frustration with students as far as, you know, being to get on or, or anything like that. They, they are very intuitive. And as I said, there's an app for it so they can use it on any type of device. You know, it's really crazy. And um, yes, I tried this with teenagers and they loved it, is that as long as their internet connection, they can use it. So they can use it on their Xbox or their PlayStation. So it's really easy to use on any type of device. Um, as far as the practice problems with the lesser of mathematics, it's a very um, purposeful part of their curriculum and that is that distributed practice. So that's where we think we have the perfect partner with Alex, which is the world's most adaptive and personalized system um, that predicts with over 92% accuracy what a student is ready to learn. And so we pair that together with, with this curriculum and it'll remediate or accelerate any student. So that I think answered that question. And, and the with rest the contact, is, with the contact information, please don't hesitate to reach out. If we can be a further um, assistance, um, more than happy to help. All right, thank you very much, uh, Brian and Anita. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So whoever's sharing the screen, if you would please stop, that would be fantastic, thank you. So we just have a few more slides and then we will be um, opening up the breakout rooms so that you may go and ask any questions that you'd like of the vendors and those breakout rooms will stay open until 7.45. Um, so a couple of things. Um, where So where do we go next? We're finishing up tonight is the last community review event. Um, everybody has an opportunity to give feedback through the end of the month. So what we're doing is data collection will be ending uh, on March 31st for the field test. And as I said earlier, the teachers will be able to use the materials through the end of the year. However, data collection will be um, will finish. At that time, we'll be um, analyzing all of the data to decide on the best one uh, to make a recommendation. And that uh, will be presented to the school board on April 26th. The school board does vote on those final recommendations for the adopted materials. One of the questions I have been asked is, um, will uh, PPS be sharing that data? And as part of that presentation to the school board, it is um, that data is provided and at that time it is made public. Um, and then in summer 2022, we start the teacher professional learning on the new instructional resources. And then fall 2022, we are implementing these new, these new materials in all of our math courses, Math 6, Math, math 6 Common Core, Math 7 Common Core, Compacted Year 1, Math 8 Common Core, and Compacted Year 2, and then uh, Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 3, 4 at the high school level. Uh, a couple of things is that um, all of these materials, a recording of this, the FAQs, links to vendor materials, as well as, again, the link to the review form is available on the adoption website. I am hoping either Mary or Susan will put into the chat a link to the vendor form. And uh, I believe that um, Susan is going to open up the breakout rooms. What we have done with the breakout rooms this evening, if you've never done this before, I just wanna walk you through it a little bit, is that um, down in the lower right-hand corner, you should see a button on your screen that says breakout rooms. If you click on that, it should open up and you should be able to choose which breakout room you want by hovering over the breakout room and moving your cursor to the right, a little join should show up and you click on that and it'll take you right to the breakout room. Um, Mary will be staying in this uh, main room 
to uh, help anybody who might be having a challenging time getting into the breakout rooms. You can then exit the breakout room, come back into the main room and visit all of the breakout rooms if you'd like. And the first breakout room is going to be mid school math. And just as a reminder, mid school math is one of the materials we're looking at for middle school math. Then the second breakout room is going to be Carnegie. Carnegie, we are um, field testing two materials from them, one for middle school and then also for high school. And then with McGraw Hill, we'll be in breakout room three with illustrative math, and that will be high school only. If there's any questions, um, we can make sure that those are open and we're here to help you. Uh, Susan and I will be popping in and out of the different rooms. I'm just going to give a second to make sure our vendors can get into those rooms first. And um, we'll go from there. All right, please feel free to join whichever breakout room you would want. And uh, if you need any help, please let us know. We can um, forcibly put your electrons where you would like them. You can just unmute in the main room here and we'll get you where you need to go. I just have a quick question. I wonder, can I ask in this, can you hear me? Absolutely, and absolutely you can ask your question and we'll okay. either tell you if we can answer it or not. <laughs> okay, sorry, I, I wasn't part of like the whole, you know, the, the Zoom meeting, I was in and out, sorry about that, but I have a question. So can parents uh, kind of have saying in some of these decisions that you guys are making, or is it just kind of decided by PPS? So, Anne, that is one of the biggest reasons why we are having this, uh, this virtual event and the in-person event. Mm -hmm. And why the feedback form is incredibly important is because that is one of the pieces of information that we do use to inform our decision. And so, yes, uh, parents do get a say so into this through that feedback form is the avenue that we have. Okay, perfect. And you can you can score things or you can just provide written comments. So, okay. Um, yeah, this year it's really important for me to kind of take part in that. Um, normally I'm not this much involved, but because we struggle so much um, this year that it's really important for me to, you know, know which math program we're going to go in, book that we're going to use for, you know, my son's going into high school soon. So it's really important for me so that he doesn't have any gap. So that's good to know. Great. We love to hear that. Yeah, thank you. Let me, let me figure out how do I get to the breakout rooms. <laughs> Would you like me to like walk you through the steps again, Anne? Um, no, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm on my phone, so I'll figure it out from my phone. Okay, yeah. On your, on your phone, it's in the right, I believe it's in the right-hand corner, and there's usually some three dots there that like, give you more choices. Yeah, more, and then it yes. gives me a kind of chat, meeting settings, minimize meeting, background <laughs> filters, and I don't see, I don't see it. We, right. can, we can put we can you, put in you into a breakout room. room and it'll oh, show oh I see it. I see it. It was on the left hand corner. Okay, I see oh. it. Thank you. What phone do you have that's in the left hand corner? It's <laughs> iPhone, but it's not the Those left -hand iPhones <laughs> have Apple products. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Kristen, this is Hannah. I just had a, a quick question I had put in the chat, but then I think it got a little buried. Um, if you don't mind that. So if mid school math was chosen for middle school and not Carnegie, does that mean Carnegie is still in the running for high school? It's not, um, I'm not sure if I would choose in the running, but it's still an option for high school. Yes. Yeah. We're not yeah. deciding on Carnegie as a package. Right. Okay. Of them are being evaluated against. So the middle school is being compared to middle school and the high school is being compared to high school. Okay. And then have you looked at how these, um, relate to the new iReady K5 and like how the, yeah. you know, the decisions you made for that around instructional materials and how that had been going and then, um, you know, how it would progress into middle school and how they yes. butt up to each other. Yes, we have. Um, that was part of the evaluation process. And then also, it's probably not very well known in the middle school, but I also uh, led the K-5 math selection process. So the pieces around the vision, what we're looking for for students, how students are engaged, um, the all of those pieces are what connects all the way through high school. So that's why these materials have been selected as field tests is 
also impart their alignment with iReady. Okay. I, I will just give you the feedback that our our fifth grade math teacher really likes iReady and he says it's way better than the other curriculums they've had and it has um, extensions for every lesson. Mm -hmm. and yes, it does. He really appreciates that because he doesn't have to do as much work to find those extensions. So I completely appreciate that feedback. I am very excited to hear that. Um, you know, extensions are an um, important piece, extensions, and then also pieces on um, how to differentiate or support learners when they may not be picking up on things as quickly as that as a critical part in how we've been evaluating these ma the materials for secondary as well. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that feedback from your fifth, your son's fifth grade teacher. That's so great. Yeah, he was excited. So yeah. Okay. And then will middle school teachers uh, be required to use this curriculum if yes. they they will be? Okay, because it seems like the sixth grade has some flexibility this year. They do because we don't have any adopted materials in middle school or high school this year. So they do have some flexibility for this year. Next year, this we will whatever we choose will be the formally adopted piece and that they will be expected to use the materials. Okay. So yeah, that's a little confusing. Yeah. And then the last question was related to um, the compacted math thing. All, all these vendors talk about how it's all customizable and this and that. And like, you know, of course, everything's customizable. <laughs> but do they have, you know, for middle school, let's say, have you looked at their compacted math, like how they pull it all together? And I mean, you don't want to have to build your own curriculum for it necessarily. So I'm, I'm just wondering... Um, if that's something they do routinely. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, it is something they do routinely, but to answer your question is we are field testing this in several compacted year, um, both resources for middle school and several compacted year one and compacted year two classes. So we are looking at their, um, their compacted, um, alignments and, and how that aligns um, and how that reflects in what is going on. So it is customizable um, and that if it doesn't, if there's pieces that don't work out or the timing's a little short or whatever like that, we can adjust it, but we are field testing those right now. So we come in very informed about any adjustments we would have to make across the system for next year. Mm -hmm. Do you like them? <laughs> I, here's what I can say. That's one it. is Susan and I get to have no opinion on which one we like, but I will say that like, I'm very happy with all of them. So there isn't anything that I'm worried of, you know, like that I would be upset with any of those. And I think Susan's in the same place. Like, I feel like our teachers and educators who selected these to field test did a really great job of selecting the top materials. They're all very highly rated by uh, Ed Reports, which is an external um, rater that has a pretty rigorous set of criteria. And they all have done exceptionally well with that rating. I was sorry, I've got my son here, but I was just going to say the same thing. Ed Reports was kind of our initial filter that really helped, uh, even though we do not have, we do not get to select the final and we do not have an opinion in this. Ed Reports helped us select the best to start with and then we go from there thanks <clears throat> we're hoping that all of the vendors hannah will provide us with links um, so that you can actually go in and play around with the curriculums a little bit more than just the hard to tell. presentations and that will be on the adoption website once we get those. I think one of the vendors was able to provide it to us tonight. That's Mid School Math. And on their slide and the PPS PowerPoint, which I've put in the chat several times, there is a, some information there. Um, I guess they have product guide and common questions asked by parents. So um, we're, we're trying to get information and links so that you can. Um, play with it a, a little bit to see what it's like, a, a particular lesson. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely, and if you, you know, you leave Hannah and there's more questions, mm -hmm. email us. Okay. 
I will say today's been a big math day. My, <laughs> I'm the, I coached math counts and it was our chapter competition. So I don't know if you. Oh, uh, that's so oh, exciting. Yeah. How did yeah. that go? It went great. I mean, we don't know the scores are yet, but we had a whole full team of uh, seventh, sixth, seventh, eighth graders doing math for fun. So it's good. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Math for fun. We want more kids wanting to do math for fun. <laughs> I give them lots of candy. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, math and oh, candy. That all powerful oh. candy. It is oh, a wow. deep motivator for middle school students. Yes. <laughs> Anna, what did you say you were you were coaching today? Um, the math counts competition, if you're familiar with that. It's a national um, middle school math competition. And a, a number of schools across the state and the country do this. Um, this would be great to have teachers be a consistent coach and pay them to do it. I do it as a volunteer, but... Um, I imagine it won't last if, <laughs> you know, once I age, age out of the school, you know, but um, it's a great way to do really, I mean, it's really hard math, like high school kind of in beyond level challenge. You know, they're very challenging problems, right? So mm -hmm. lots of logic stuff too. So they don't have to know like calculus or anything. It's just, um, it's a very structured thing. I did it way back when in my middle school <laughs> years too. <laughs> well, thank you. Did you want to go to any breakout room? Yeah, I'll, I'll quit gabbing with you. Sorry. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> we like gabbing. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to go talk to mid school math a little bit, but yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Susan, do you want to stop the recording? Yes, I will do that. Isha, thanks for being here.